Drop it! Power, power panel. Just two powers. Wait. Is it a panel power panel and there's only two of us? Uh, that's the controversy raging throughout the nation tonight. Uh, is there a poll on it? No. Should there be? Probably. Uh, so, but John and I are so powerful uh, that I think it might be a power panel nonetheless. Uh, there you go. There you go. John Hulk. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, all right. Uh, seriously, we've got a great show ahead for you guys uh, because of the technical difficulties we've been having uh, because of climate change, uh, quite literally, uh, in L.A., uh, causing uh, things to melt down in the city. Uh, we're going with just two folks, me and John, first hour, me and Jessica, second hour. You guys going to love the show. It's unbelievable. Unbelievable. If you're a member and you hang around long enough today, you're going to find out what splooting is. And it's not quite as dirty as you think it is. Okay. So, having said that, we go to Dark Brandon. We do. Let's do that now. I see them out there, and now we're going to build this new bridge here. We're all for it. And by the way, this new road, and we're going to have an internet that's going to be all the way. I love them, man. If you want to know what's happening, it's an escalation in violence. Okay, so when did the devil get a special geographic assignment to kill children and children? What's the cop your side in attacking the other one? Here's more of what he had to say. We also passed once in a generation investment in our nation's roads, highways, bridges, railroads, ports, airports, water systems, high speed internet. We got a little help from Republicans. But not a lot, but enough to get it passed. But the truth is, there are a lot more Republicans taking credit for that bill than we actually voted for it. I see them out there, and now we're going to build this new bridge here. We're all for it. And by the way, this new road, and we're going to have an internet that's going to be all the way. I love them, man. They ain't got no shame. They don't have any shame. <laughs> Okay, so there he's talking about some of what the Democrats, and with a little bit of Republican help in some cases, were able to pass not too long ago. The $1.2 trillion infrastructure bill that was passed last year to improve roads, bridges, ports, water systems, high-speed internet, and more. 13 Republicans in the House helped out on that, 19 in the Senate, which doesn't sound bad, but there are 213 Republicans in the House and 50 Republicans in the Senate. So overwhelmingly, they were not supportive. And we're going to get to more of the substance, but... Jenk, I just want to pause on not just the, the the substance of what he's saying, but the way that he's saying it. He he really does seem more lucid. He seems more comfortable, more jokey, more energetic. I don't I don't think this is just memes. He does kind of seem different in the way that he's speaking these days. Yeah, there's several explanations for this, John. Uh, I'm glad you asked. Uh, first is obviously. Dark Brandon, but laser eyes. Okay, uh, Dark Brandon's obviously taken over, and uh, he's uh, obviously Joe Biden's alter ego and uh, a much cooler dude. Uh, a little known fact: um, Dark Brandon was also in charge uh, when Biden took on Corn Pop. Um, <laughs> it's uh, it's a little bit like um, the Marvel series uh, that you and I watched. Um, why am I blanking on it now? The one with the mummy, Egypt? Moon Knight. Yeah, Moon Knight. He's Moon Knight. That's that's that, that, that's all, right? He's <laughs> got a couple guys in there. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that's that's uh that's one uh possibility. Okay. Second possibility is drugs. Um okay, I don't I mean people are saying I don't know what people uh advisors are putting in uh Biden's Wheaties. I I, I don't know what it is either, but uh kidding aside, he is only 2,000% more energetic um, and interesting in these speeches than he has been for the last couple of years. Uh, okay, but now finally the real answer. Um, not to say that the other two aren't perfect, you know, aren't <laughs> completely out of bounds. But anyway, uh, <clears throat> seriously, uh, there's a giant difference between electoral Biden and legislative Biden. Uh, electoral Biden uh, does a pretty good job. 
I mean, I mean, he did win the election. Obviously, he won the very competitive primary. Did uh, you know Obama uh, help him get there? Did MSNBC, CNN, New York Times, et cetera, help me get there? Of course, right. But he did win, right? And and now on the campaign trail, he's a, much more energetic uh, and much more in defense of Democratic positions, which are very popular and actually attacking Republicans. When it comes to legislative Biden, he goes back to okay, whichever one that was the boring Moon Knight character, uh, and uh, and. And there's reason for that, because when it is electoral politics, it's about his power and the power of the elites and how they have to maintain it. When it gets to legislative politics, well, that's having to deliver on campaign promises that would help you. Mm -hmm. and they don't really want to do that. So all of a sudden, zzz, power down, let JoJo run everything. That's what he called Joe Manchin the other day. So it, it's there is a very, very real reason why you're seeing Joe Biden more animated now. Uh, and by the way, which Joe Biden should you expect if the Democrats hold Congress? Back to zzz, he's going to shut it down. This is not going to uh, keep going like this. And he's going to go back to, oh, there's nothing I can do. I have a fight Republicans. No, oh, I love Republicans. He's going to go back to that. It's a 100% guarantee because politics is only about one thing, money. I think it's a 99% guarantee. I think that there is a very small chance that he starts to actually like doing something with his presidency. He's getting a lot of positive reinforcement, including from the sorts of Democrats that he wouldn't normally get it from. I think he almost certainly will, whether for the ide ideological reasons you described or because you can only take these drugs for so long before they stop working. Uh, I can't say for sure. Uh, or maybe one of the other alternates will take over and he'll wake up strapped to a bed surrounded by a ring of sand. I'm not entirely sure. Um, but anyway, yeah, we would never see him do that same mocking tone, like impersonating Joe Manchin. He would never do that. Joe Manchin yeah. shameless. Come on. He would never say that. But also, he wouldn't generally say it about the Republicans that he just said it about. I mean, he's mocking a couple of hundred Republicans, effectively, which Democrats do during elections. Definitely, they love, they love doing that. But Joe Biden doesn't necessarily do that. And again, it's not like he was naming names, which we're going to do in just a minute, but but he was more aggressive than he used to be. And, and maybe that's something you don't come back from. Maybe. I don't know. Yeah. But, but I do well, overall like that he's taking it to the Republicans. He's actually publicizing the things that they did that have good effects. Now, yes, the 2021 infrastructure bill has plenty in, a, in it that we think was just massive billion dollar giveaways to uh, industry and all that, but it does some good stuff. And all too often the Democrats pass something rarely and then never talk about it again. So he, and, and not only is he talking about it, but he's making it interesting enough that people will cover it. It's not just a boring thing where they say that they did such and such a thing with a pipe or whatever. He's mocking them, and that will draw the eyes as it has with us. Yeah. So, look, John, I'll grant you. In fact, I'll even go to 98% chance that he's going to shut back down, 2% chance that he's going to keep dark Brandon. Now, why? Uh, because, it, guys, I don't want you to think that this is just um, uh, just like a, a phenomenon uh, that happens all the time either. Like, I, be credit where credit is due. Uh, Biden is being much tougher than any Democratic president usually is under similar circumstances, much tougher than Pelosi and Schumer have been against Republicans, et cetera, et cetera, uh, and much tougher than he's ever been, ever, 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 ever. So there is a second phenomenon going on that gives you that 2% chance uh, that he might continue being tough, which is the polling. They're looking at the polling, and every time that Biden flexes, his numbers go up. And it's not just about Biden. You know, so Fetterman uh, runs a really tough campaign. His numbers skyrocket. Uh, now even Gavin Newsom is pretending to be a tough guy. Gavin, pretty boy Newsom, right? So soon Buttigieg will be out there and be like, I'll tell you what, I can't stand Republicans. Because they're all actors, right? So the new director has said the numbers are showing, the ratings are showing that they like Dark Brandon, that they like tougher Democrats. So go out and pretend to be a tougher Democrat. Good, I'll take it because the rhetoric matters. Messaging matters, media matters. So though that's overall a positive thing and I would much, much, much rather have Democrats win obviously than the Republicans. 
But at the same time, I, it's our job to keep it real with you guys. Uh, number one, is it going to affect the substance? Well, as we just said, 2% chance. Like, still, at the end of the day, they're slaves to money. Uh, when their donors say jump, they say how high. Uh, they have no strength against their donors at all. They will, could do a complete collapse, and they did. We should, told you they would when everybody was excited. And, oh, my God, Biden's FDR 2.0. You guys remember that a couple of years ago, right? And I came out here, and I was a sourpuss. I'm a turtle optimist, but I told you guys, look, my job is to give you your real news. He's not going to do any of those things. He's, and, and people are like, Jake, you're outrageous. You think he won't do voting rights? You think he won't do $15 minimum wage? You're crazy, right? No, he didn't do any of those things. He didn't do the bare minimum because he, will, he works for the donors, period. They all work for the donors. Okay, so last thing on this. As we're excited that he's fighting back against the Republicans a little bit, let's also note that it's really the bare minimum. I mean, it's not like he's ripping their face off. He's like mildly criticizing them. And for Democrats, even though it's like the lowest bar in America, they think, whoa, man, we just broke the world record in the long jump, right? Or the high jump. No, no, when it's the donors, you break the world record on the high jump. When it's attacking the Republicans, I mean, John, what do you think? Is this 5% of what I would do? 10%, 20%? Yeah, I. It, it's possible you would have rushed the crowd, maybe. Um, <laughs> thrown the podium, maybe. I'm not entirely sure. Maybe maybe someday we'll see. But um, yeah, I, I, we'll have to see. I, I want to I wanna keep seeing this style of rhetoric, but much, much more importantly, I want to keep seeing him doing things that justify the rhetoric. You're talking this way, giving the speech about fascism a week after you cancel a good a, a chunk of student loan debt is one thing. Even if he were to keep doing it, but the student loan debt was the last thing that he did, or the climate change bill, uh, then that'll start to wear on us after a few months, after six months, after one year. You got to keep actually accomplishing things. And thankfully for him, whether they maintain control of the Senate or the House or not, there are a number of things that he can do along the way. But let's... um. Let's mention a few names. Uh, Joe Biden attacked the Republicans for publicizing the idea that they got money through the infrastructure bill, a bill that they voted against. Joe Biden wasn't naming names specifically, but um, but we can do that, actually. Uh, and this is pretty common for Republicans. So there was a press release from Representative Ashley Hinson said that $829 million that the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers was going to get to uh, modernize locks and dams on the Mississippi River was game-changing. And it might well be. That sounds really good for uh, that area. Uh, but back in November, when uh, they were trying to pass that bill, she called it a raw deal for Iowans and spending at its worst. Couldn't be that worst if you're going to be promoting it. And so happy that the money went through. Uh, let's see. Kay Granger celebrated the news that uh, $403 million for a flood control project uh, would be going through for Texas, her state. Uh, that funding was allocated as a result of the infrastructure bill as well. Uh, she called it a liberal wish list in November. I guess she is now out as a liberal because she apparently got what she wished. Um, and so th there's a ton of these, honestly. There's Republicans calling the the bill, which regardless of which infrastructure bill we're talking about, like the worst kind of socialism or it's going to lead to the destruction of America. But as soon as they vote no, they put on their coat, they put on their hat, and then they rush home to their district to start talking about how they got the money. Some of them, Jake, talk about how they were leaders in securing it. Like they were instrumental in making sure that the bill they fear mongered about and tried to stop actually went through. It's pathetic. And there's only so much you can do to try to get people to understand that that gap between their rhetoric and what they actually did. But I'm glad that they keep bringing it up. I want to see it in campaign ads, too. Yeah. Um, so uh, the politicians are liars. Shock me. Color, color me shocked. First time I'm hearing about it. Uh, but by the way, if you're 50 years or older, it probably is the first time you're hearing about it because you probably grew up on television. And in television, they think politicians are the most honest people in America. No, they're all goddamn liars. So, of course, they're like, I, I hate this. It's social communism. Marxism. I love it. I brought it to you. Oh, I'm the greatest. Come on. Mm -hmm. 
They're obvious, obvious, monstrous, weirdo liars, okay? So, but uh, last couple things here. Don't get it twisted on the infrastructure bill either. That it had plenty of good things, but it was a giant corporate pork bill. That's why it passed. That's why it got a, a couple of Republicans to vote for it. In the old days, all the Republicans would have voted for it because uh, they're like, ah, donor money for everybody. Okay, so it's all almost all that money is going to go to corporations to build those things, and we need those things. But that's why it passed in Washington because the money is first going to giant corporations. Otherwise, nothing thou shalt not pass. And finally, uh, to John's point, the reason why I have 2% hope rather than 0% hope that Dark Brandon survives the election either way is because of the student debt bill, uh, the, the student debt relief. Like, so Biden did a couple of things. He had about 5% change. He was on the classic Obama 5% change track. Uh, but then doing the student debt relief, and then passing a couple more bills, I got him up to kind of around 15% of his promises. And for a Democrat, I think that uh, over the last 40 years, that probably breaks a record. So that I have a tiny bit of hope that he'll do a couple more things in the next two years if they hold Congress. Yeah, yeah, especially, and, and again, I will focus on like it, all the things that Congress and having the Senate or, you know, whether if they were eventually able to actually get rid of the filibuster, do carve outs, that would all be great. There's a million things they could do, but he doesn't need to have those things to still be able to deliver. And in, in particular, on many of his promises, he could deschedule marijuana or decriminalize or whatever. He could do that now. He doesn't need the Senate. He doesn't need the House. And there's been a lot of activists putting pressure on him. Uh, Fetterman brought it up to him apparently when Biden recently visited. Uh, I believe it might have been over Labor Day. I'm not sure. But um, that would be a great thing that he could do that it, he said that he would do. Um, and he doesn't need the Senate in the House for. So I would love to see that. But anyway, I want to go to one more video because I think he gets another dig in at the Republicans in this. Guess what? You know, Republicans talk about being fiscally responsible. We are reducing the deficit while all these things we're doing to spend money. <laughs> not a joke. Last year, I reduced the deficit $350 billion. So I don't want to hear it from Republicans about fiscal responsibility. I don't want to hear it. Well, I mean it. I, he's, uh, I don't want to get going here. I think he did get going there. He sort of laughed it off at the end, but he actually sounded a little bit mad. I was worried he was going to heat ray the audience for a bit. Um, and... Look, I don't care about the deficit reduction. I think that the bills could have been stronger if there had not been such a big focus on that, if that hadn't been such a, a massive delay for the bills in many cases. Uh, you know, Manchin wanting to make sure that they, they generate as much revenue as possible. I don't think in comparison to the challenges that we face, that should be one of the main priorities. But he is also doing that. And the Republicans love to talk about being like fiscally responsible. We also know that basically the only thing they prioritize when they every decade or so, you know, manage to squeak through a presidential win through the Electoral College is to hand, I don't know, one point five, two trillion dollars in tax cuts to the wealthiest people in the country. There's nothing responsible about it. The only reason that that stereotype has lingered for so long is because the media likes the idea that Republicans are better for the economy. They're not better for the economy. They're better for the people in the media who make large amounts of money. And so I'm glad that Biden is mocking that idea, too. Yeah. Super last things. Uh, he's got to stop saying no joke. Why? Is everything else a joke? <laughs> Why does he keep saying that? It's so weird. Um, OK, uh, but on, on a positive note, look, uh, more reasons to hope. Uh, student debt relief. Um, when he was contemplating it, every elitist came out, everyone in the establishment came out and said, don't do it. If you do it, the sky will fall. Uh, the Republicans will bash you for doing giveaways to regular people, right? And everybody will hate it and your poll numbers will plummet and we'll lose the midterms. And shockingly, he didn't listen to that. And, uh, and they did debt relief. And I told you the political calculation behind that. Look, for the people who don't like the debt relief, it's a tiny percentage of their calculation. Are they really going to vote on that? Somebody else got debt relief. I'm voting against them. Maybe, maybe 1% of people. But for everyone who got debt relief, it was the biggest issue in their life. Yeah. So 40 million people are now excited to go vote for Biden and Democrats. And you could see it in the poll numbers. So since the sky didn't fall and the establishment pricks were lying and now exposed as either liars or idiots, 
there's some chance that Biden saw that or Dark Brandon saw it and was like, mm, I see you guys. Mm-hmm. And maybe if I legalize marijuana like I said I would, or he partly said he would, maybe this guy won't fall then either. Maybe people, maybe my poll numbers will go back up. Because for politicians, it's either about money or ego. So maybe if we could get his ego going in the right direction, he might pass a couple of more bills in the next two years. Fingers crossed. Uh, why don't we go to our first break? Dude, we're going to go to the break, guys. we got to go to the break, okay? But when we come back, uh, here comes Bernie Sanders. Kind of call out Joe Manchin. Everybody's got laser eyes today. All right, we'll tell you about it when we come back. Back on TYT, Jank, John, Phantoms Forever, uh, they just became a member, and so did uh, Ty Bonds. Uh, genius move. Big brain, big brain. Just hit the join button right below uh, the video on YouTube. That's a good idea. TYT.com slash join. Also big brain. You want to talk about big brain? On Twitch, Viewbot Prime wrote in, uh, is it me or does Jank look like Cristiano Ronaldo with this haircut? I don't know. People are asking. Is it Jank? Is it Ronaldo? Is it rumors? Jank Naldo? Is it dark Jank Naldo? Nobody knows, but people are asking. Okay. I'm gonna okay. I'm gonna have to ask the people to stop asking. <laughs> Cristiano Ronaldo with only like an extra 150 pounds or so. Uh, okay. All right. Go ahead, John. Okay, let's jump into some fun with this. I beg of my colleagues that at this moment. When the future of the world is literally at stake, that at this moment we have the courage to stand up to the fossil fuel industry and to tell them and the politicians that they sponsor that the future of the planet is more important than their short-term profits. summary that was released last month. This bill would make it easier for the fossil fuel industry to receive permits to complete some of the dirtiest and most polluting oil and gas projects in America. Specifically, this deal would approve the 6.6 billion Mountain Valley Pipeline, a 303-mile frack gas pipeline spanning from West Virginia to Virginia and potentially on to North Carolina. We're talking about a pipeline that would generate emissions equivalent to 37 coal plants or over 27 million cars each and every year. Having this side deal, and he gave you some of the details in that big speech uh, that he just gave yesterday about what this deal that was pitched to us as necessary for Joe Manchin to sign on to the climate change bill that would produce a fast track process for more fossil fuel infrastructure deals and that would severely undercut the overall efforts of the climate change bill to deal with the threat that we're facing. And he's not just warning people that they need to take a second look at this. He's saying right now that if it continues uh, as it's planned, it will be attached to a government funding bill He's not going to vote uh, yes for it. He says, uh, you're talking about the future for the planet. And that's Bernie trying to appeal to his uh, colleagues. But it's not just him in the Senate. Um, Some of the nation's leading progressives have signed on to a leader urging House leadership, uh, a letter, I should say, urging House leadership not to attach a bill fast-tracking those permits to must-pass legislation for funding the government past September 30th. And we've got a list of the signatories. um, uh, That's uh, Candace Cole, reporter for TYT, was able to get that. The letter's author, uh, Raul Grijalva, uh, told Yahoo Finance that more than 60 House members had signed on. That includes people like AOC, the rest of the squad, Pramila Jayapal, Jerry Nadler, Katie Porter, Jamie Raskin. In fact, I think we can bring up a list. It is possible that it has grown since this list was acquired, but it is something like 60 names. And so you have a a large number of people uh, encouraging House leadership to not tie this to the other bill. And by the way, 
both on the House and the Senate side, Democratic leadership has made clear over the last year that they're perfectly willing to say things will be tied together and then not do it in the end. So I feel like this would fit historic precedent, Cenk. But what do you make of this? Yeah. So, look, uh, there's a lot of really good news out of this. Uh, I, I to, to be honest, which is what we always do, I thought the speech was going to be a little bit tougher. I watched the whole thing and it was good headlines about it. And we showed you uh, some of the best parts right there. Uh, but um, but overall, it's it's a really good start, and there's something even more important than that. Uh, so it's a good start because he started talking about campaign contributions. Um, I was hoping he was going to name names, but I know, I know, with Democrats in Washington, oh, their colleagues, feelings, feelings would be caught, right? So he mentioned Manchin, but in, not in the context of campaign contributions, but he did talk about oil money. So, hey, at least for the first time, we're getting progressives in Congress to dare to talk about the third rail, which is campaign contributions that their uh, corrupt uh, Democratic colleagues live off of. That's why they don't talk about it, because that's why it's not Republican feelings. Sure, they care about that, too, but it's mainly Democratic feelings they're trying to protect. But, OK, takes uh, a first step in that direction. That's wonderful. More importantly, he's saying, look, if you put the side deal in the uh, continuing resolution, which is a must pass bill, it's basically a budget bill. I'm going to vote no. Oh, OK, now that's real. Put aside rhetoric, a no vote it makes it harder for it to pass. That is actual power that is using your power for leverage. I love it, Bernie. Keep that going. Uh, the second person who signed on to saying no is, of course, Ro Khanna. So always leading in these cases. You got to give him tremendous credit for that. So um, speaking of credit, I got to mention two other things that are really important in this story. And it, it, they actually involve us. And we're um, so, uh, number one, Candace Cole, our new Washington correspondent, has been doing an amazing job, literally the best job in the country in following this story. She broke the original story that uh, that there was a letter in the first place that Grijalva was organizing and getting progressives to sign. She broke the story that it wasn't a couple of people. It was 30 to 40 people that had signed on to it. And, and now she's going to have a new story coming out. It turns out the latest number is 71 people. OK, so you can check that out at tyt.com slash stories, all the different things she wrote. Now, the second part is this petition that you're looking at. So we started this petition uh, saying, Speaker Pelosi, don't force progressives to vote against the budget bill. You see, the framing on that is important because it says if you put it in the budget bill, it is going to force progressives to vote. No. OK, so it's it's one extra step from the letter. The letter says please don't do it. This petition says, if you do it, you're going to force us to vote no. Okay. So that's a, that's a tough ask for people to sign. For you guys, a super easy ask. Go to tyt.com slash petitions and sign it uh, right now. More people that sign it, the more power it has and the more leverage for progressives to kill the side deal. It's uh, tyt.com slash petitions slash no side deal. But if you just go to TYT.com slash petitions, you get there anyway. And remember, all the links are always down below in the description box if you're watching on YouTube or Facebook later. OK. Yeah. And then finally, um, there is one guy who already signed the petition in Congress. You'll never guess. Yeah. Same guy, Ro Khanna. Again, tremendous credit for leading here. So you've seen me disagree with him sometimes on interviews, uh, but he always shows up. He always tells you why he does something. He's always leading and and brave and brave on this one too. saying, no, that's it. We're voting no if you put it in the budget bill. So nice. here comes Ro Khanna, Here comes Bernie Sanders. And now this is a real fight. And now they got a fight on their hands and they might actually now they got an actual fighter's chance at killing that side deal, which is huge. Amazing. Um, you mentioned this, so I just want to go very briefly, minimal commentary to just a couple more sections of the speech. He, he did talk about the power of lobbyists in the fossil fuel industry. Let's jump to that. Like every other senator, I understand what campaign contributions are about. I understand what the thousands of lobbyists all over the political system. Like every other senator, I understand what campaign contributions are about. I understand what the thousands of lobbyists all over Capitol Hill do. 
And I surely understand the extraordinary power of the fossil fuel industry to push the legislation that they want. In fact, they were successful for decades in lying to the American people about the reality of climate change. So I know about the power of the fossil fuel industry. And look, it's a point that he returns to later in the speech about how you have, you know, effectively every scientist on the planet, you have these environmental groups, you have entire generations who understand that climate change is the main threat that uh, we're faced with. And then on the other side, you have the fossil fuel industries and the donations that they give to every Republican and basically all of the Democrats as well. But I, but I agree with you, Jenk. Imagine how much more powerful that would be if he then pulled out a Katie Porter style whiteboard that had the amount that Schumer's gotten, the amount that Manchin's gotten, the amount that all of them have gotten. And, uh, you know, made clear that this isn't just a, a thing that exists. You know, there's lobbyists and stuff. But here's specifically how much they've given in the past year to try to get this deal. I think that would have made it much stronger. Yeah. Uh, look, uh, as you know, I once ran for Congress uh, just to do that whiteboard. I mean, that would have been 90 percent. Hey, look, these guys are corrupt. Here's the bribe that Manchin took. Here's the bribe that Cinema took. It would shake the world. Uh, and I, I've been, and that's why I supported Nina Turner's run both times as much as I could possibly do, because I was sure that she would do the whiteboard. To this day, Jesus Christ, I've been covering politics for a quarter of a century, and not one progressive has had the courage to say, my Democratic colleague has taken this amount from this industry and that is a campaign contribution, that is a bribe, and they vote with them because of the goddamn money. We all know it. Every single person in America knows it. The only people who deny it are people in Congress. Now, having said that, I've been waiting 25 years. They wouldn't even say the word campaign contribution. They wouldn't talk about corruption under penalty of law, not even Bernie. None of them would do it. Ever, 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 right? So finally, we've broken through a little bit, and he is saying it. And he is saying it's because of the money. He is saying it's because of the campaign contributions. And believe it or not, for us, that might be step one. But in, in Washington, that's the rumblings of an earthquake. I guarantee you there's a lot of Democrats who are super pissed at Bernie tonight because they're like, oh, he mentioned campaign contributions. Rawr! And because they're worried that he's going to out them. And in, in a sense, he has begun to out them. Well, actually, while we're talking about money and politics, why don't we quickly transition to this next story because it's uh, all about that. There's an effort inside of the DNC to ban dark money in primary elections. But right now, the DNC has very effectively blocked that. They're not even allowing a vote on the resolution to accomplish that to actually go forward. This is just yesterday, by the way. They refused to allow, allow a vote on a resolution aimed at banning dark money from the party's primary process, a decision that sparked outrage from progressive DNC members and others who backed the proposal. So this was led by Nevada Democratic Party Chief uh, Judith Whitmer. The resolution would have prohibited dark money funding, quote, during any and all Democratic primary elections and established procedures for the investigation of dark money use by candidate committees, as well as possible disciplinary action. I would like to see more than just possible disciplinary action if you want it to be something that is effectively banned. But um, shortly before refusing to allow a vote on the ban, the resolutions committee approved a separate measure that, quote, condemns the use of dark money that runs contrary to the values and principles of donors, which maybe I'm missing something, but I feel like that wording is almost telling. It's not even that it's condemning the use of dark money that runs contrary to the values of the party or their constituents or America or the Constitution. They still centered it on the values and principles of donors, which is the entire problem. But the idea that they're going to throw out this, the, this, this condemnation that has no enforcement, it's not going to ban anyone from using it, implying that it can distort the process, it can corrupt things but they're not going to do anything to actually ban it. I mean, that that's really admitting like one of the core problems of the Democratic Party right there. Yeah. So look, it, typical Democratic stuff. Uh, so when I tell you that most of the Democratic establishment is corrupt, this is why. So 
you know, uh, people in mainstream media, uh, they don't like facts. It, it makes them uncomfortable because then uh, that implicates their powerful friends who are, they're trying to protect uh, for a living. So when I point out, yeah, well, when you take a million bucks from an industry, you might be influenced by that. They're like, that is outrageous, right? So, um, and I say, okay, well, you think it's outrageous, but over 90% of Americans think it's obvious. So then we say, okay, then ban the dark money, uh, and the dark money is the corrupting influence. They say, yeah, okay, dark money is corrupting influence. Got it, got it, absolutely, sure. Uh, lip service, lip service, right? Uh, and then you say, okay, well, then the DNC should ban the dark money. They're like, how dare you? But wait, do you mean it or don't you mean it? And by the way, notice this is a very important part of the story. They didn't even allow a vote because nope. a vote is embarrassing. It's embarrassing. That's why the Young Turks audience had to successfully fight for a vote on $15 minimum wage. They weren't even going to have one until you guys stepped in. And uh, look, we never get the credit because mainstream media doesn't want progressives to win. Right? It doesn't care about progressives, despises progressives, wouldn't give progressives credit if its life depended on it. But you guys did that. You forced a vote. And what happened? It embarrassed eight Democrats who wound up voting against it, including Biden's top allies, right? That's why they don't want votes. So at the DNC, should they have at least voted to see who's in favor of corruption and who's against it? Of course they should have voted on that. And that's why they didn't vote, because they don't want you to find out who's in favor of corruption, because the answer is at least 90% of the party. Yeah. Yeah, and the 90% of the party that is for the corruption loves the effect that that corruption has had in this primary season. You know, we've done a primary coverage of pretty much every night. In fact, we're going to be doing coverage next Tuesday, by the way. You can tune in live, and it'll be Jank and myself and Emma Vigland. Um, but think about the millions of dollars that have been used to sink multiple progressive candidates and challengers. The money has just come in at the last minute, much of it right wing money, literal Republican billionaire money being used to manipulate uh, the outcome of a Democratic primary. If you're a centrist Democrat looking at this, you love the effect that dark money has had because your side is always going to have more of it because you're the corporate part of the party. So. Yeah, I, I don't know how they force that vote and force a ban, but this is super important to make sure that future primaries aren't uh, as manipulated as this one clearly was. Yeah, so uh, look, could two more things on this. Uh, first of all, uh, John's right. This isn't just, hey, I need the dark money to run against Republicans. It's much more so, hey, I need the dark money to run against progressives in the primaries. Otherwise, most of the seats we're in are super comfortable blue seats. I'm not worried about the Republican. I'm worried about the progressive who actually wants to get things done. My donors don't want to get anything done. So I need that donor money to kill off the progressives who are actual Democrats. So there's no way they're going to vote on that bill because the DNC is the heart of darkness. It's the heart of the corruption. And they need that corruption against us progressives who actually believe in the democratic agenda. So that that's why it was, it was a fait accompli. Look, the progressives that fought, uh, uh, fought for it are amazing, including our own Nina Turner. She's got a show coming out in October for us called Unbossed. You should check that out, uh, youtube.com slash unbossed TYT. She was all over this. She fought super hard for it. But uh, the, our best shot was Keith Ellison beating uh, Tom Perez. They did every dirty trick in the book. They bought in, brought in uh, the wrestler, nicknamed the establishment. That's Barack Obama, and he helped uh, Perez push it over the top. And since then, the forces of corruption have ruled the DNC. They've always ruled the DNC. But that was our best chance to get the castle. We couldn't, and so none of this is surprising. The people uh, who run the DNC. Uh, love, love, love bribery and corruption and use it against us. But the last thing I can tell you is there, there, there is hope, okay? We will eventually get dark money out of politics. You know how? Uh, when there's enough either of you guys pulling your money together or rich progressives that give to Rebellion Pack. Like either you guys give to RebellionPack.com in enough numbers or the rich progressives do or some combination. Why? So Rebellion Pack's the pack I started. You give me, you know, however much money, right? But you need real money. Let's make up a number. I don't need you to give it to me right now. I'm just telling you what we would do with that money. Let's say we had what a normal pack has. And no, this is tiny for a normal pack, $20 million, okay? 
I would batter conservative and corporate Democrats with that 20 million. If we had $200 million in the rebellion pack, uh, I'll, I'll give you the world. I'll give you democracy back. You know why? Because we would pound the corporate Democrats into oblivion with our money. And then they go, no, 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 no. I, 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 I don't know where the money's going into for a rebellion pack. I don't know. I don't know where it's coming from. Just, we, we can't have this money. We can't have this money. And then all of a sudden, it would pass overnight. Okay. Let's use our money to defeat their money. Agreed. Uh, I think it's time for our second break. When we come back, though, uh, the right wing uh, has fallen in love with Britain. We'll give you all the details after this. T.Y.T. Jank and John and Doc Smith. Doc just became a member. Thank you. Hit that join button right below the YouTube uh, video. We appreciate everybody else. TYT.com slash join. Uh, but I'll give last word to uh, Tubby. Uh, that's T-A-B-I. It uh, means, of course, in Turkish. Uh, they wrote in, I need some Jank love, compassion, and passion. Wow. Thank you. To that, I say, of course, or Tubby. <laughs> It doesn't have the same <laughs> thing. A, a t-shirt that just said, Tubby, not as good. <laughs> it could also match me, but in a different way. Let's make uh, it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, all right, John, what's next? Okay, the, the most ridiculous story. Let, let's finish the first hour with this. A country in the North Atlantic the size of Alabama that somehow took over the world and ruled it with decency unmatched by any empire in human history. The British Empire was not perfect, but it was far more humane than any other, ever. It's gone now, barely even remembered. Queen Elizabeth II was the last living link to a truly great Britain. ...that as of Tuesday or Wednesday uh, would have loved George Washington and the founders of America. Now they're filthy rebel scum who separated us from the greatest empire ever to grace the face of Earth. And uh, look, we're going to give you the actual historic facts about the good and the bad of the British Empire. But he's not interested in that. He's interested in whitewashing, genocide, slavery, concentration camps, famine, and more, as he'll do in this clip. In the real world, the one that we live in, strong countries dominate weak countries. And that trend shows no sign of changing. So despite what they may be claiming on Twitter tonight, the British Empire was more than just genocide. In fact, the British did not commit genocide, except arguably against the Dutch during the Boer War. The British did give the world the Magna Carta and habeas corpus and free speech. They helped end the transatlantic slave trade, as well as the ritual murder of widows in India. The British Empire spread Protestant Christianity to the entire world. There are so many hilarious Tucker carlson -y flourishes there. So he will only acknowledge genocide if it's against white people. That's the only time that it could exist. In the same way that in a later part of the clip, he will acknowledge that a political leader could be racist, but it has to be the black president of an African nation. That's the only time they can be racist. Other than that, they're more than just genocide. Is, isn't, is he not merciful? That he briefly alluded to the possibility that they had killed many, many people, while then going on to give them credit for ending the transatlantic slave trade that they enthusiastically participated in and made bank on for hundreds of years. Man, this dude loves participation trophies when it's two empires. Yeah. So uh, this is actually a really important segment because it has uh, two uh, things that – Tucker Carlson is doing, and uh, they're both dangerous. So first, what he's doing here is supporting the monarchy. And it, you might think, well, the Queen Elizabeth died. It was a white Western empire, and and so he, he's nostalgic about it, right? No, no, no. Uh, he's had Curtis Arwin on his show. Uh, so did I. I wanted to see what this right-wing philosopher uh, was talking about. And Curtis is in favor of a monarchy. And he calls it a monarchy because it sounds a little bit better than a dictator, because that's what it is. It's a dictator. And so, uh, but Tuck Carlson had Curtis on uh, to agree with him. So there's a very, very big difference. 
And uh, and so they, he's been quoting him. Uh, Steve Bannon has been quoting uh, Curtis Sherwin. And, and so have uh, Peter Thiel, Blake Masters, J.D. Vance. So they are enamored with the idea of America turning back into being ruled by a monarchy, i.e. a dictator, i.e. a right-wing dictator. So that was an ode to dictatorship that you just saw there. And by the way, literally, you can't argue with it. That's what the empire was, and that is what he's celebrating, okay? So um, now, the second part of what he did there was classic racism. Now, you guys, if you're like professors in the area, you might know it. If you're really uh, well-educated, you might know it. Most people are going to miss it. But this is, if you study the history of Western colonization and imperialism, saying, well, the empire might have taken all of your natural resources and subjugated you and made you work for it, uh, but you're way better off because we brought you civilization. You were savages be uh, before us. Why were you savages? Look at you. You're dark. You're brown. You're black. And Tucker does that all the time, and he did it in this segment. He talked about how the British had built the greatest building in India, and it was a train station, and India has built nothing like that ever since. Uh, well, before then, they did build the Taj Mahal several hundred years earlier. That was pretty spectacular, one of the most spectacular buildings in the world. Funny enough, Tucker didn't mention that, although the building is white, so you would think that he would have liked it. But white people didn't build it, so that was left out. OK, so uh, when it came to the Africa, he's like dictators rule the place. Well, what the hell's the queen? What the hell's a king? It's a dictator. When it's a white dictator that ruling over brown and black people, it's awesome. And the most benign empire ever. When it's black people ruling themselves, they're no good, dirty dictators. And guys, this is not without context. This is exactly what empires have been saying for hundreds of years. And then just so you're absolutely clear, he said the second part, which is we brought them Christian, Protestant, Protestant Christianity. What else could they want, these savages? We brought them our civilized religion. It is Empire 101. And John, funny enough, he didn't seem to talk about the raping or the pillaging at all. No, no, no raping, no pillaging. Um, he admitted that they had done something bad in being mean to the Dutch, which they very much were very bad to those Dutch settlers. Um, Dutch settlers committed all sorts of their own crimes. That's the only time he'll acknowledge that they did something wrong, was when it's to someone else that he codes as white. Then it's acceptable. Uh, but no, the, the famines that they willingly initiated that led to the deaths of millions, no. The wars that they started, whether for colonization, for just domination of an area, or to maintain trade access, uh, as in China with the Opium Wars, no, that's not worth actually mentioning. Either he doesn't know, which I find very plausible, I don't think he's nearly as smart as most people think, um, or he just doesn't think that you need to know, because his goal in covering this wasn't even the goal that it very easily could have been. If he was as triggered by people celebrating the death of the queen as he implied he was at the beginning of the segment, he could have just defended her. Or he could have just defended what Britain did during her reign. That's not what he did. He decided that he was going to defend in an ahistoric way the entirety of the British Empire back hundreds of years. And he did it for the reasons that you said. It is to reinforce to his audience that di dictatorship is better and more effective and more productive than democracy and white supremacy makes sense. It's better for white people. It's also better for the non-white people that they conquer. That is explicitly what the message of that segment was. And it's no surprise that other right-wing pundits are you know, following after him, trying to do the same thing. Charlie Kirk, who, if it's possible, knows less about history than Tucker Carlson, he did it. I'm not even sure that it's worth going to, but this is an opportunity for them to reinforce to their audience that democracy is bad, multiracial democracy is worse. Yeah, so uh, real quick, uh, two more things here. Uh, now, this is a different empire, very similar tactics, though. Uh, when uh, the conquistadors took over the Aztec Empire, uh, what they did is they would bring up uh, Aztecs one by one onto the top of a hill, and they would ask them in Spanish, a language they did not understand. Do you take Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Because they would bring them that beautiful, beautiful Christianity that would civilize them. 
And when they didn't answer because they don't speak Spanish, they said, oh, they I guess they're rejecting uh, Jesus Christ. And they would chop their heads off because they were savages. Because the Aztecs were savages. So the, the Spanish were forced to chop their heads off on, on, in, on behalf of beautiful, merciful Christianity. And that's what Tucker Carlson is celebrating tonight. So, look, we, we're going to get into, let me give, give you a list of the crimes of the British Empire. If we went into all of them, it would take hours and hours and hours. But the First and Second Opium Wars, which I'm going to come back to, the Boer concentration camps, camps the Armistice Massacre, the resettlement of Chinese people in Malaysia, the invasion of Tibet, torture centers in Yemen, the Cyprus internment campaign, the brutal crushing of the Iraqi rebellion, the Bengal famine, let alone everything they did in India, okay? And look, hold on, let me actually walk that back for a second. We're more, way more balanced than Tucker Carlson. So I'm not telling you that the British uh, Empire was only bad. No, 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 no. There, there's, there's one or two things he said that were correct. They did do the Magna Carta, and they did bring us habeas corpus until the Bush administration destroyed it. Okay, that's, and Tucker Carlson celebrated it when we were destroying habeas corpus, saying that the detainees in Guantanamo Bay shouldn't have it. They were trying down to not knock down a pillar of actual great Western civilization, okay? So, and the British Empire did bring English to India and it did have an ironic unifying effect. Uh, they, and they did bring uh, bridges and railroads. All that is true. What, by the way, why did they build the bridges and the railroads? Out of the goodness of their heart? No, to move the product that they have stolen from India. Okay, that's just a, but it did help in the long run. So that is a, a well-rounded look at what the British Empire did. But I'm just going to give you one details on the Opium Wars. And, and this is another plague that uh, Britain unleashed on us. But to be fair, it would have come no matter what. So they started corporations, them and the Dutch. And the British East India Company and other corporations wound up investing all over the world. And then speculation began. In the case of the Opium Wars, uh, they had gotten companies, official British companies, had gotten uh, a huge percent of the Chinese population addicted to opium because they were making money off of selling them opium. And China, having seen 40 million Chinese devastated by opium, said no more. We're making opium illegal. Britain, the British Empire, invaded them to make the selling of opium legal again because they were making money off the drug trafficking. They were the largest drug cartel in world history. They destroyed the lives of 40 million Chinese people on purpose for profit. And when the Chinese government wouldn't go along with it, they devastated the Chinese government, humiliated it, took Hong Kong, and subjugated it. That is what Tucker Carlson calls benign. I think that's all the time we have, unfortunately. Yes. All right. Uh, amazing hour. We got another amazing hour. Good news. Another amazing hour coming up for you guys. Uh, so uh, there's a story that you that you've literally heard nowhere else before, and it's amazing. And then we're going to go to Robert Copeland, uh, the guy who believes in demons and probably is one. You're going to love it. We'll be right back. Thanks for listening to the full episode of The Young Turks. Support our work, listen ad-free, access members-only bonus content, and more by subscribing to Apple Podcasts at apple.co slash TYT. I'm your host, Cenk Uger, and I'll see you soon.